Gospel Shows, Alabama, and our next door neighbor has a huge, huge oak tree right beside our driveway. And we've just come through the season where all the acorns fall off. And so when I get up in the morning to go get the mail and I step on those acorns, I've never been inspired to write a sermon. <laughs> I have thanked the Lord that I don't cuss anymore. <laughs> but I really did enjoy your insight on that passage in Galatians. I didn't, that was wonderful. Thank you, Brother Teeman, for your invitation. Take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 4. Together, that's the theme, together. Uh, what is it that brings us and holds us together? When I was a young preacher, the most divisive element in threatening Southern Baptists was the charismatic issue. The charismatic movement was sweeping through the nation and a lot of Baptist people got caught up in that and uh, and so that was a real uh, a threat to the unity of our people was the charismatic influence. Today, I suppose that Calvinism has become one of the more divisive things in our denomination, but, but, I, but to be very honest with you, I have, I have a lot of friends who are charismatic, and they think they have something that I don't have, and I have a lot of friends who are Calvinists, and they think they know something that I don't know, but that's all right. I'm just going to keep preaching Jesus because I believe he is the one who holds us together. And so if you are a charismatic, enjoy your gifts. If you are a Calvinist, enjoy your theology. But this morning, I'm going to not deal with those things that may be divisive. I want to speak about that which unites us together. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogues were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said unto them, You will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, No prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah. When the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land, but unto none of them was Elijah sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. 
and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him into the brow of the hill whereon their city was built that they might cast him down headlong. But he passing through the midst of them went his way. I live in Muscle Shoals up in northwest Alabama. Not too far to the west of Muscle Shoals is a town called Hackleburg, Alabama. Now, a few years ago, the tornadoes blew a whole lot of it away. But if you were to go into the city limits of Hackleburg, there's a sign that says, Welcome to Hackleburg, Alabama, the hometown of Sonny James. Now, you may not know who Sonny James was, but back in the 70s and 80s, Sonny James was the number one country western artist in the world. He had 26 number one hits in that music genre. I suppose his most famous song was Young Love, First Love. Now your children can't sing it, but you probably can. He died just recently and he was carried back and buried in Hackleburg. If you were to go a little west of where, east of where I live in Muscle Shoals, there's a town called Addison, Alabama. As you enter the city limits of Addison, Alabama, there's a sign that says, Welcome to Addison, Alabama, the hometown of Pat Buttram. Now, you may not know who Pat Buttram was, but he was the comic sidekick to Gene Autry in most of Gene Autry's movies. And he was also the actor who played the part of Mr. Haney on the television series, Green Acres. If you were to go into the city limits of Tupelo, Mississippi, you would see a sign that said, Welcome to Tupelo, Mississippi, the hometown of Elvis Presley. Now, you may not have known who Sonny James was, and you may not have known who Pat Buttram was, but if you don't know who Elvis Presley was, you ain't nothing but a hound dog. That's all, that's all I can tell you. You know, a lot of small towns have their hometown hero. The Bible says that Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. Nazareth was his hometown. Now, he wasn't born there. He was born in Bethlehem. But Jesus only lived 33 years before he was crucified. And 30 of those 33 years, he lived in Nazareth. It was his hometown. He knew those people and they knew him. He had grown up there. He had participated in every kind of life that could be offered in Nazareth. He had participated in family life. He grew up with Mary, his mother, and Joseph, his adopted father. And the Bible teaches that after Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, that Mary and Joseph had a normal husband-wife relationship and, and children were born into that relationship. Jesus had at least four half-brothers that are identified by name in the New Testament. James, who wrote the book of James, was a half-brother of the Lord Jesus. Jude, who wrote the book of Jude, was a half-brother of the Lord Jesus. And not only did he have at least four half-brothers, he had at least two half-sisters. Now, they're not identified by name in the Bible, but they're simply referred to as his sisters. Plural. There may have been more than two, but at least two. So Jesus experienced family life. He knew what it was to be a son. He knew what it was to be a big brother. He also experienced business life. He grew up in Joseph's carpentry shop. Joseph was a master carpenter, and Jesus became a master carpenter. He knew how to take wood carving implement, instruments and, and carve and design beautiful pieces of furniture. 
He participated in the community life. Jesus was not a hermit. As a boy, he went to school. He went to the marketplace. He went to the public arenas and heard speakers speak on various subjects. He participated in the spiritual life of Nazareth. The Bible says he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as his custom was on the Sabbath day, he went to the synagogue. Aren't you glad we serve a Savior who was faithful in attending the house of God? And so Jesus participated in every kind of life that a person could participate in, and yet there was no sign going into the city limits of Nazareth which said, welcome to Nazareth, the hometown of Jesus. Now why? The reason is very simple, because in all of the 30 years he lived there, even though he participated in home life and business life and community life and religious life, in spite of all of that, in all of those 30 years, Jesus in Nazareth never performed a single miracle, not one. Now, as soon as he left Nazareth, he began to perform miracles everywhere he went. He made the blind to see and the deaf to hear and the muted to speak and the crippled to walk. Why, he even caused the wind to stop blowing and he walked on water. Why, he even raised the dead. And word comes back to Nazareth. Do you know that young man that grew up here in the home of Joseph and Mary? That young man who was a, car a carpenter? Do you know that young man has gone out into the world and he's become the greatest miracle worker the world has ever known? Everywhere he goes, he's performing miracles. And they begin to whisper around Nazareth. Well, why didn't he do that here? We have blind people in Nazareth. We have deaf people in Nazareth. We have cripple people in Nazareth. We have dead people in Nazareth. Why didn't he do any of that here? And then word began to spread. Hey, 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 he's coming back. He's coming back. He's coming back to Nazareth. And all they begin to buzz. I'm telling you, it's exciting. He's coming back. The miracle worker, he's coming here. He's coming back. He's coming home. And oh, they get excited. The ruler of the synagogue, he hears that Jesus is coming back. And so he arranges for Jesus on that first Sabbath day after he comes. He's, he's arranged for Jesus to be the one who's going to be the teacher and the preacher for the day. And so the Sabbath day comes and it is jam-packed. I don't know how many people normally went to Sabbath services, uh, synagogue services on the Sabbath day in Nazareth, but on this day, the place is absolutely packed out. Everybody wants to see him. Everybody wants to hear him. Everybody deep down hopes he'll do a miracle for us today. Oh, they're excited. And Jesus walks in, the ruler of the synagogue gives him the book of Isaiah. Jesus turns in Isaiah to what you and I would call Isaiah chapter 61, verses one and two. It is a passage of scripture about the Messiah that was going to come. 700 years before Jesus was ever born, Isaiah said the Messiah is coming, the anointed one, the one sent from God. And Jesus read those two verses, Isaiah 61, verses one and two about the Messiah. Those are wonderful verses. Those verses tell us the Messiah is going to be a preacher. He's going to preach the gospel to the poor. He's going to preach deliverance to the captive. He's going to preach recovering of sight to the blind. He's going to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. The Messiah is a preacher, but also the Messiah is a healer. He's going to heal the brokenhearted. That word brokenhearted means those who are just sick in their soul. As I travel around place after place, church after church, 
uh, I find that there are a lot of people today who are just sick in their spirit. And they'll tell you, Brother Bob, I, I, I don't have any aches. I don't have any pains physically. I'm fine, but I'm just sick on the inside. Sometimes sin can cause that. Sometimes a Christian can get off into some little old silly sin. Maybe they didn't even plan to do it. Maybe they just did it. And sin can make your soul real, real sick. Maybe you get your feelings hurt. Somebody said something about you that hurt your feelings or they took your class away or they took some other starring role from you and your feelings are hurt and you're sick on the inside. Well, the Messiah, Isaiah said, the Messiah would heal those who are sick in their soul. But not only is the Messiah going to be a preacher and a healer, he's going to be a liberator. He will set at liberty them that are bruised. That word bruised is such a strong word. It refers to those people who've just been crushed. They've been beaten down. Listen to me, life is not fair. There are some people who seemingly spend their whole life floating on flowery beds of ease. But there's some people, boy, heartache after heartache, tragedy after tragedy. There are some people who are just so wounded. They're, they're enslaved. They're shackled by discouragement and depression. But the Messiah, he will liberate those who are bound in discouragement. And so the Messiah, the preacher, the healer, the liberator. Isaiah said he was going to come. Jesus read those verses. He closed the book. He gave it back to the minister and he sat down. Now he wasn't being rude. He wasn't being offensive. That's the way they did it then. They stood up to read and then they sat down to teach or to preach. The last few weeks that seemed awful appealing to me. I have to be honest with you. I see Dr. Stanley, he sits a lot of time on his stoop, but he's 85 years old. He can do what he wants to do. And the Bible says, and every eye was fastened on him. They had heard him read about the Messiah. Everybody in the house, everybody in the house knew what those two verses were about. The ruler of the synagogue knew. Jesus knew. All of the attenders knew. Everybody there knew. He's going to talk to us about the Messiah that's coming. And every eye was fastened on him. I wish I could tell you that every time I stand up to preach, every eye is fastened on me, but they're not. Sometimes people are sound asleep. Sometimes they're looking around to see who's there and who's not there. But that expression, their eyes were fastened, it is a picture of people sitting on the very edge of their seat in eager anticipation, just waiting to hear what he's going to say about the Messiah. And so there's the setting for what happens in the synagogue that morning in Nazareth. Three things happen. First of all, there is an un mistakable declaration. An unmistakable declaration. In verse 21, Jesus says to all of those people whose eyes were fastened on him, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ear. An unmistakable declaration. This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Jesus was unmistakably declaring himself to be the Messiah. 
Now, some of the liberals say Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah, but the problem with liberals is they just won't read the Bible. (laughs) Jesus unmistakably declares himself, I am the Messiah. This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears and all of these people whose eyes were fastened on him they began to boast. what did he say said it was a messiah what did he say said it was a messiah is not this joseph's son what did he say i've told you three times he's the messiah don't ask me and you can just hear them one lady says my soul i have a i have a table in my dining room he built it Another says, I have a chair in my living room. He he crafted it and put it together. Another says, I have a dresser in my bedroom. He carved it. He made it. He built it. Is not this Joseph's son? But not only do I see an unmistakable declaration, I also see undeniable Revelation. Jesus reveals two things about all these people sitting in the synagogue. First of all, he reveals what they are thinking. He says in verse 23, Now you will surely say unto me. Now how did he know what they were going to say before they said it? because he's God. The devil cannot read your mind, but Jesus can. He knows what you're thinking. That's why the Bible says we're to bring every thought under the captivity of Christ. He reads our thoughts. He reads our mind. He knew what they were thinking. He said, you will surely say unto me, this proverb, physician, heal thyself. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means, Jesus, if you can go down to Capernaum and perform miracles, if you can go over there and heal the sick and raise the dead, if you can go down to the Sea of Galilee and walk on water and perform other miracles over nature, then why don't you do it here? He reveals their thoughts, but then he does something much more intense. He reveals their hearts. And it's very interesting how he did it. First of all, he dared, he dared to compare himself with Elijah and Elisha. Of all the prophets of the Old Testament, and hey, according to Hebrew history, there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of prophets. Most of them, we don't know who they are or where they serve. We don't know anything about them. Now, there are a few prophets we know who they are because they wrote books in the Bible like Ezekiel and Daniel and Isaiah, Jeremiah, Amos, Obadiah, Joel, Habakkuk, and all this few others. But most of the prophets, most of them, we have no knowledge of them at all. But of all the prophets of Israel, the two most beloved and most revered and most honored and respected were Elijah and Elisha. If Jesus had compared himself to Nahum and Obadiah, not one word would have been spoken. But he dared to compare himself to Elijah and Elisha. And then he did this. He dared to suggest that God loves Gentiles as much as he loves Jews. Jews. And here's how he did it. He said, do you remember when Elijah was the big boy prophet? Do you remember when Elijah was the beloved prophet of God? Do you remember in Elijah's tenure of office? There was a period of three years and six months without any rain at all. Not one drop. There was drought, there was famine because there had been no rain for three and a half years. As I was driving into Montgomery last night, I saw three signs over the highway that said the the burn ban is still in effect because 
of no rain. What's it been, 20 days? Well, that's pretty severe for us. But can you imagine three years and six months, no rain? Everything was dying. All the vegetation died. All the animals died. And many, many people died. There were hundreds and thousands of Jewish widow women who died of starvation. And Jesus said, but God did not send Elijah to a single one of those Jewish widows, not one. God only sent Elijah to one widow. And she lived in Sarepta, the Old Testament says Zarephath, a Gentile woman. Elijah goes to her house and knocks on the door. She comes to the door. He says, ma'am, I've come to live with you and your son. And as long as I'm here, I expect you to feed me. And she says, well, sir, I only have enough oil in the cruise and enough meal in the bin to make one more little cake, and I'm going to do that today. My son and I are going to eat it, and then we're going to sit here and look at each other while we starve to death. Elijah said, oh, that's not going to happen. As long as I'm here, there's going to be plenty of food. There's going to be enough meal. There's going to be enough oil every day. We're going to fare well. The rest of the world may die, but we're going to eat well. And that happened. But God did not send him to a single Jewish widow. And they were dying by the thousands. Jesus said, do you remember when Elisha was the big boy prophet? When he was number one? Do you remember that there was a plague of leprosy that swept through Israel like we had never known before in all of our history? And thousands of Jewish men were falling down dead because of leprosy. And God did not send Elisha to a single Jewish man, not one. There was only one man, Elisha, healed in that time of horrible leprosy. A man by the name of Naaman, who was a captain in the Syrian army. I want to tell you, Jews hate Syria today. And they hated Syria in the day of Jesus as well. That bigotry has always been there. That hatred's always been there. But Jesus said, Elijah did not rescue one Jewish widow. Elisha did not rescue one Jewish man. The only widow helped was a Gentile. The only man cured was a Gentile. And the Bible says when those who were there in the synagogue heard that, they were filled with wrath. Now these are the same folks. These are the same folks that were sitting there with their eyes fixed on him. These were the same ones that began to buzz. It's not this Joseph's son. And now he has dared to compare himself to Elijah and Elisha and he has dared to suggest that God loves Gentiles as much as he does Jews. And they were filled. You could just see the blood rising up their heads and popping the cork off the top. They were filled with wrath. Bible says he was thrust out. That's a strong term. It's a picture of men, some on either side of him. Some grab him by the arm. Some grab him by the waist. Some grab him by the legs. Big, strong, muscular, burly men. And they carry him out of the synagogue. And that doesn't satisfy them. They carry him out of the city limits. And that doesn't satisfy them. They carry him to the cliff on which their city was built, the very edge of the cliff, and they're going to throw him down head first. They want to see the rocks rip his body apart. They want to see the boulders 
crush his head in. Their intention is to kill him. And that brings me to the last thing, an unmistakable declaration, undeniable revelation, but an unexplainable separation. Here are these men, at least three on each side, big, strong men, and they have him in their grips and they're going to throw him down the cliff. And he's gone. He's not running. He's not hiding. Verse 30 says, he, as he walked through the midst of them, he went his way. Now how did that happen? I don't know. And you don't either. You see that ring right there? I worked six years to wear that ring. After I graduated from Sanford University, after I graduated from Mid-America Seminary, I went back and for six years, I worked and worked hard to wear that ring. That ring says, I have an earned PhD degree. It is pronounced Food. <laughs> it says to you that I'm like an Airedale dog. I'm smarter than I look. <laughs> and I'm telling you, I don't know how that happened. They were there. He was in their hands. They were going to throw him down. And he was gone. Well, they wanted a miracle. You better be careful what you ask God for. You're liable to get it. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. But I know why it happened. It was the beginning of the judgment of God on Nazareth. Jesus went to Nazareth, his hometown, where he had spent 30 of his 33 years. He knew those people. He loved those people. And he offers himself to them. I'm your Messiah. I'm the one Isaiah was writing about. I'm him. Oh, that they would have received him, that they would have welcomed him, that they would have embraced him, that they would have loved him, but they didn't. They rejected him. They hated him. They tried to kill him. And he walking through the midst of them went his way. And John Gill, the theologian, says there is no evidence that Jesus ever went back to Nazareth again. You see, you can say no to Jesus one time too many. And he just went his way. There are a lot of things that would divide our togetherness. But the one common bond, the one unifying person, is Jesus Christ. He is the Messiah. He is greater than Elijah and Elisha. He loves people of all colors and all races and all ethnic backgrounds and all languages. And he will save anyone who will receive him. But to those who reject him, one time too many, he just goes his way. May the Lord help us as pastors, evangelists, lay persons, Christians, to be unashamed to talk about the source of our togetherness, Jesus.